uh, how does he want us to, to know that somehow the promises Ulysses makes to his companions, he wants to lead them to virtual knowledge, may really be a faulty promise. And this is, the, I think, the substance of the canto. Dante will refer to it with a famous metaphor as a mad flight. Remember, Ulysses recounts how they made a made flight out of the oars, mixing metaphors as Dante had done before, the, 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 the maritime journey and the air journey. This is uh, the journey, the flight of the mind, the flight of the intellect, as if it were described by a sailor. Man, Ulysses is a sailor. What, 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 how does Dante uh, make us aware that this is indeed this madness in what Ulysses is trying to accomplish. Very simply, he puts him within a peculiar, distinct, a, a distinct political and rhetorical context. So that you really have to wonder, can he really deliver these promises? And what are the political consequences of the promises that he makes? The whole, the whole Canto 26 is literally littered with fallen cities. From this point of view, it begins with Troy, uh, with, I'm sorry, Florence, Dante has this apostrophe against the city of Florence, uh, the city of thieves, that's what he calls it, spreading its wings as if we're also, as if cities were like heroes engaged in great flights. Uh, there's a clear desire on Dante's part to have us connect the story of Ulysses' uh, uh, self uh, uh, degradation, turpitude, with the story of, uh, of, uh, of Ulysses, Florence's uh, uh, turpitude and Ulysses' uh, own fall. Then there is a reference to the city of Troy, fallen city. There is a reference to Thebes with the ref with, through Eteocles and Polynes. Uh, there is uh, also a reference to Rome. The, city, the canto is full of references to cities. From this point of view, canto 26 is a version a, a brief version of the epic, because the impulse of the epic is always political. No, there is no epic that you can think of which doesn't think about, is not trying to represent the, either the uh, falling cities and the edification of new cities, or for that matter, uh, some locating a city, it could be in a great grand metaphysical drama, it could be in the heavenly Jerusalem, or uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's Rome, it's Carthage, uh, it's Thebes, falling cities and rising cities. So uh, this is what the, the strategy of Dante. Dante's strategy is to show then how the grand philosophical claims of Ulysses have effects that make it appear as empty rhetoric. He, he, Dante praises Ulysses nowhere, somewhere in the ocean, without a particular place. He goes from one city to another, and at the same time, because of this, he can never quite, doesn't seem to be able to deliver on what he has promised. It's a reflection on one particular aspect of the tragic story of Ulysses. It's the tragedy of language a language that m contains with itself all the most incredible mirages, and yet it falls short of reality. Ulysses is literally placed in, uh, in, the, in the empty ocean, uh, away from all responsibilities and all locations. And it is this gratuitousness of his quest uh, that also accounts for uh, his being in, uh, uh, in, 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 in hell among the evil our uh, counselors, um, okay? So this is what I was trying to tell you last time, and I think that I have added on today a few other details, uh, but we can go back to that if, uh, uh, if, if there is to be a discussion, and I hope there will be a little later. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Canto 27 which I really like to read in conjunction, usually should be read in conjunction with Canto uh, 26. Because we, here we have what I would call a counter myth to the story of Ulysses. There is a contraction of focus. Uh, uh, there is even a, a revision of the claims of epic grandeur that we have in Canto 26. Dante meets, and he's the one to become the interlocutor of Guido, da Montefeltro, a, an extraordinary figure, a political leader, that's what he was, who then experienced the conversion. He became 
a Franciscan friar. And historically, this is a historical figure. Historically, he's called in by the Pope, Boniface VIII. By now, you know him. He's not someone that Dante really holds in the highest esteem possible. And Boniface VIII, in an inversion of the relations between uh, priest and, and, uh, um, and cleric, high priest and cleric, asks Guido da Montefeltro for some advice. We are dealing again with evil counselors. And the advice is the following. You have to teach me. You're a great man of arms. You have to tell me what, is, what, is, what are the um, strategies I should pursue in order to conquer Palestrina, a small town. You may know it as a place of a, the origin of a great musician from there, but a small town near Rome. I want to conquer and destroy the city of Palestrina. You tell me how I am to do this. So we're really dealing with uh, Machiavellian, a Machiavellian world of counselors.